Well, welcome everybody to the uh, spring install installment of the University of New Mexico Department of Anthropology Colloquium Series. We're very excited uh, uh, for today's speaker. Before I introduce him, um, let me uh, acknowledge that the University of New Mexico uh, was founded in 1889 and sits on the traditional land, uh, homelands of the Pueblo of Sandia. The original peoples of New Mexico, Pueblo, Navajo, and Apache since time immemorial have deep connections to the land and have made significant contributions to the broader community statewide. We honor the land itself and those who remain stewards of this land throughout the generations and also acknowledge our committed relationship to indigenous peoples. We greatly recognize our history. So today we have um, a, a new member of our University of New Mexico uh, community speaking with us, uh, Dr. Gordon Am Ambrosino, uh, who is the new NAGPRA coordinator for the Maxwell Museum of Anthropology. Uh, Gordon's research centers on the agency of art in, in constructing place-based histories at specific times and across time, informed by his prior and current repatriation consultations with native cultural leaders through NAGPRA. His work more specifically focuses upon reestablishing the inextricable connections between museum collections, past and present people, and the land to illustrate the manifold ways in which art links identities to specific places. Today, we're very excited to, to hear about um, some recent work that uh, Gordon has done on the Bears Ears Project. So today he's going to be giving us a talk called the Bears Ears Project Consultation, uh, Collaborative Exhibition Curation and Community Outreach. Gordon, welcome to the University of New Mexico. We're very happy to have you here and we're very excited uh, uh, for this opportunity to, to learn more about the work that you've done during this colloquium today. Thank you. Great, thank you, Ian. Uh, thank you all for taking time this afternoon to, to you know, listen listen to this story. Um, again, my name is Gordon. I've been the NACPA coordinator here at the Maxwell Museum since mid-November. It's a pleasure to be here. And so let me just uh, go ahead and share my screen really quick. I won't introduce myself too much at this moment because I will be, in a way, introducing myself throughout. And so the title of, the, of today's talk, The Bears Ears Project, Consultation, Collaborative Exhibition, Curation, and Community Outreach, is really focused on what was my the, the central aspect of my postdoctoral appointment at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, which is a forthcoming um, museum exhibition that focuses primarily on uh, the Bears Ears National Monument and its people. And so what I'm going to be doing in this exhibition is really tying together uh, two really sort of seemingly unrelated things with the Bears Ears region, one being NAGPRA consultation and repatriation, the other being ND and rock art research. And so I hope it works. So let's just um, move on here. Let me get my, my full screen up here for you. Okay, let me get my display settings. Okay, I think this should be working properly. Now, okay, so the first part of, of the talk today is really just going to talk about the project origins. And so I'll first be providing a little bit of background about NAGPRA and how it relates to the land and some basics about the law. And I'll be telling, following up with a little bit of my story of repatriation consultations, primarily at the Field Museum uh, and then um, afterwards at, at LACMA. And that will transition into a, sto a short story about collaborative rock art research in Peru, which really sort of generated a lot of the foundation. Uh, for the Bears Ears um, exhibition. And in, the, in that section, I'll be going over a few case studies really quick, which will really sort of give some, uh, some, some insight for the second half of the talk. Uh, the first part of the talk should probably take about 15 minutes and the, the second half um, will, will comprise the majority of the talk. And so they'll be focused on Bears Ears Living Land, which is the, um, which, which is the, the working title. And I will start off with just talking about, you know, consultation with our partners and uh, the development of the content over the course of the last three years and so forth. Uh, the basic issues of humanities and problems that it seeks to address. I'll follow that up with a walkthrough of the exhibition, which will focus on the thematic galleries, which will essentially convey how these uh, humanities issues or themes will be woven through or uh, presented in the exhibition. And I'll follow that up, that up with, our, um, with our programming strategies. And I have a lot of uh, photos in this exhibition, which are not my own. I got them off of the internet. I, I do admit I was not able to find um, proper credits for all of them. So I do apologize for that in advance. So starting off really basic, um, so, some important um, background context, um, just about uh, 
colonialism and anthropological news here. And as many of us know, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries and sort of the heyday of museum development, there was focused on this cultural history paradigm, which really focused on classification. And in many regards, people were in museum settings were treated in the same way as maybe plants or animals or even dinosaurs and just classified in, sort of in, in certain ways. And this was, these collection building strategies were really based on this salvage paradigm, the idea that the cultures were dying and so forth. And so these co collections had to be amassed so to, in order to preserve what was left of the culture, or so it was thought uh, at that time. And as a result, museums really, in essence, kind of became treasure chests of colonialism. And this is kind of where all of, all of a lot of many, frankly, looted things were, had been kept. And as a result, they had been centers for generational trauma. And people, when they came to museums, were really forced to uh, sort of encounter, come face to face with a lot of other much larger colonial issues uh, in, in the US, particularly um, in the museum setting. And of course, we know there was, in, in this period, there's always exclusive access to, to collections. So, so curators could basically sit you know, in their own offices and so forth and really give a yay or nay in who actually had uh, access to these collections. And for a large part of museum's histories, this wasn't native peoples or descendant uh, communities. This all started to change around the year 1990. Uh, and over the last, uh, course of the last 30 years or so forth, museums have really been creating unique opportunities for positive change and collaboration and inclusion, and really for building relationships between people. And more so, they've always been places of learning, but the type of learning has changed over the, over the last 30 years. And as a result, people, has, museums have really had more so become places of healing. Now, this is an ongoing process, and it's not a done, they are not, we cannot say that museums are places of healing yet, but we are trying to go in that direction. And so what happened in 1990 was the advent of NAGPRA. And I'll give some basics here um, just because everyone in the audience um, might not be too familiar with NAGPRA, but NAGPRA is the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. And essentially it's a mix of laws. It comes from Indian law or sovereignty or human rights law, property law, and administrative law, meaning that anyone who really receives federal funds. And so it, it sort of, it's, it's, it picks from these different areas of law and that's how NAGPRA came about. And that's sort of the basis of NAGPRA, which partially might explain the reasons why it has so many gray areas. But as we know, NAGPRA is about repatriation and is about collections, but it is also very much land based. And so on the one hand, we have to deal with land ownership issues. Where did these objects come from? Who was the owner of the land? And once we define who the owner of the land is, then we can define who's responsible for reporting and doing consultation and repatriation. And of course, because we're talking about objects and ancestors that pertain to indigenous communities, they are in so many ways inextricably linked back to the land. So NAGPRA in, in these sense is very much a land-based legislation. And so as far as consulting with NAGPRA is concerned, part of, part of the NAGPRA process is that museums and federal agencies need to consult with Native communities to determine cultural affiliation, which is sort of a central aspect of, of repatriation. And I've been fortunate to do consultations in various parts of, of the United States, particularly in the Southwest, the Southeast, and in Alaska. And in my experience, I've known the Southwest has been a, is a particularly complex area because of the plurality of this land and the overlapping nature of these landscapes, which is something I'll elaborate on further uh, you know, along in this talk. And as a result, we really have a lot of uh, con contestation in this environment as far as repatriation consultations are concerned. There's a lot of different perspectives, different views and so forth, which are really sort of, sort, of a, sort of a central guiding point of this exhibition. So my story started really in 2006 uh, when I was working at the Field Museum. Uh, from 2006 and 2000 until 2010, where I was doing consultations with communities primarily in the Southwest and in Alaska. And a large part of my job was to, was to facilitate visits uh, from native communities to come to the museum where delegates would come and help us identify things that were eligible for NAGPRA. And then we would compile archival information and photograph the collections and bring them out to the communities and so forth uh, for elders and other folks that couldn't make it to Chicago. And one of the central aspects uh, that I noticed in, in these repatriation claims is that these, these, the interrelations between past and present people, objects in the museum, and the land. 
And so the, the photographs on the left here are the, the first points I was talking about, the, the consultation process in the museum of bringing people to the museum and then disseminating information at the, at the tribal communities. And our photo in the upper right hand corner here is a photo of one of our tribal partners telling us how a certain object that was eventually repatriated related to a specific rock art site. And so for me, that really generated my interest in rock art study and relating landscape to museum collections. And I, another critical aspect that I learned in this process was really that collections are living, that they are living beings themselves, that they are sentient beings. In a, in, 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 they are very much so sentient beings. And our photo in the lower right here is an example of a, of a house screen, Plinkett house screen that we, rep that we repatriated while I was at LACMA. This was one of my side projects. Um, aside from the Bears Ears project while I was there. And this screen is called an atwu, which is essentially a living being. And so there was a ceremony and a process to breathe life into this. And so it doesn't just hold the voices of the ancestors and the memories of the ancestors. It is a living being itself and it should be treated as such. So this really laid the foundation for my transition to rock art research in the Central Andrews, which was focused on the Fort Delays of Ignimbrite, which is our photograph on the top here, this craggy, rock formation, which is centered in a, a high altitude setting in the central Andes around 14,000 feet altitude. And it consists of 15 rock floors, which are, which are called cerros. And they are also considered living beings themselves. And these cerros uh, all hold a high density and diversity of rock art. And we can see different types of the petroglyphs and pictographs here below. And it's set in a very vertical environment that transects three ecological tiers. So on our map of the right here, we see these black blobs. And these are the outcrops of the, of the Fortalezic membrane. The red dots and the yellow dot are the indigenous pueblos uh, that, of the people who live in and around the FI and who consider these cerros ancestral beings themselves. And the most important um, historical records or the, the earliest historical records come from a, a friar named uh, Hernandez Principe who visited the, in the 17th century. And he stayed at a town called Ichoca, which is our yellow dot right here. And he identified ethnic distinctions between lowland Wari people and highland Yaquas mobile herders. He also identified the, what are called four Ajus. And the Ajus are corporate descent groups. They're sort of like family lineages, I suppose. And there are, there are four main that I identify, but the one that we'll focus on briefly here is called Paichatu, Paichatu which, is, which is our star right here. And he also identified that each one of these Aju lineages had their own lineage symbol. So pausing briefly, it's important to go over some important concepts in, in, in Indian cosmology and social landscape relations. And this will become relevant later when I start talking more about bears ears. In the upper right hand corner, we can see here we have Pacha or Mama Pacha, which is divided into three main realms. We have the underworld of Uku Pacha, Kai Pacha, which is the earth, earth plane, and Hanan Pacha, which is the sky world. And there are certain access points between these worlds. So to get from Uku Pacha to Kai Pacha, there are springs or Pacarina or caves, which are called Machai. And so in terms of ancestors and the land, the physicality of the land, the lower part of our screen here, we see that we have this nested system. The most expansive and regional level, we have Apu, which are the glaciers or the giant mountains, also considered living beings. In more local or regional, less regional levels, we have Waka, which are also considered to be bodies or living spaces of ancestors or ancestral beings themselves. And at the most local or family level, we have Malki, which are the mummified ancestors, the named ancestors themselves. And the Malki live within Chulpa, which are freestanding tombs, or Machai, again, which are caves, which are passage points or access points into the underworld. And lastly, in our, in our box here on the left side of the screen, we have Kamai, which is the embodied life, life, life force that flows through everything and it animates everything, maybe something sort of like chi. Uh, and we also have Tinku, which is this concept of confluence or union. It's a coming together of, of, of realms, maybe realms of Pacha, coming together of rivers, coming together of people. Okay, so these are important concepts. We've kind of guided the fundamental aspects of Bears Ears again, which I'll get into a little bit later. So before starting this rock art research, much like the, the NAGPRA consultations, I started consultations with each one of these communities just to introduce myself and to gain permission. And sometimes these consultations and introductions were pretty casual, you know, like in the photo on the left here, these were just, you know, you know small meetings by the, by the reservoir there. And people said, oh yeah, that sounds, sounds great. Um, 
yeah, just go ahead and do your thing. We'd like to, you know, we're, we're interested in it. And other times there were more people involved and there were more different perspectives and these became kind of more tense discussions. And so these were tricky things to navigate. And I think my NAGPRA consultation prior actually kind of helped give me some training in this regard, especially since I was dealing in another language. Um, so that was very helpful. And fortunately we were able to get permission Excuse me while I take my headphones off. I don't think I need them right now since I'm not actually listening to anyone. So the first main case study that I'm, I'm gonna go through really quickly here in this deals with social emplacement. And this goes back to our idea of the Pajalta Aiju. And after, after taking the regional survey data and excavation data, I was able to link this double arc uh, image here on various points uh, throughout the FI with the Pajalta Aiju. And this, this image, like many other limit, imi, rock art images on the FI, are, they are, they're linked to Waka and Pacarina and Tinku, and they're associated with Malki and Machai. So they check all of these, these, landscape, these critical landscape concepts uh, in the Andean world. And I won't get into this too much because it's uh, beyond the scope of today's talk, is that essentially what was concluded is that rock art acted as history. Not necessarily as a written history as we like to think of as Westerners, but really is a sort of a way of inscribing the landscape in a sense to in, primarily in terms of water rights and family inheritance of, of, of water at these critical landscape junctures. So moving along, the second case study focuses on pal petroglyph palimpsest at Kenyan Tanka during the formative, formative period. And so Kenyan Tanka is a waka as well. And this is, this is our photo of Kenyan Tanka. Kenyan Tanka is not the rock art panel, it is the full boulder itself. And Kenyan Tanka on its side, on the side of it has this um, deeply cut um, canal, which was uh, for ceremonial purposes where libations were put uh, into the canal. And in our red box here, we have a very dense pictograph panel, which we can see a rendering of right here. And so again, looking, you know, going into the, the, the survey and excavation data, our typology for the images that were put on this rock art covers a long period of time spanning from approximately 1500 BC to around 200 BC. And so this study really conceptually focuses on what are single and multiple palimpsests. And what we have in a single palimpsest are, are similar image types where people come as part of a process of perhaps pilgrimage and they put a similar image type to sort of mark that they were there, okay? And a multiple palimpsest is various image types that are put in relationship with each other, to each other, so that they create almost a sort of dialogue. So looking here, we have our rendering again, and we'll look at phase one of, of the incising tradition of petroglyphs on, on Kenyan Tanka. And we can see here what we have, what resembles a single, uh, uh, petroglyph palimpsest is, is what they're referred to in rock art research. And so we have these stick figures with front facing, uh, front facing stick figures basically that don't seem to have too much of a relationship with each other. We move into phase two, we see these zoomorphic images being juxtaposed with anthropomorphic images and see these things are starting to kind of create a dialogue now. And this becomes more intense with, with, the, with the introduction of phase three. Um, 600 to 200 BC. And so what we're seeing now is that we have a multiple palimpsest and things are being put into dialogue. And if we take a closer look at one of these relationships, we can see our phase two image right here with the zoomorph. And we have the phase three that's actually carved right into it. So it's actually creating almost what looks to be one being, an animated being itself. And so we see of this process of nearly 1500 years at Kenyan Tanka, we see these evolving historical narratives, again, developed at a critical landscape juncture, Anahuaca, at a Pacarina, and an access point to the underworld where the ancestors live and where they come from and where one can communicate with them. And so lastly, briefly, I'll talk about um, our friend here, Wambre Illa. And Wambre Illa is, what, it, what that means in Quechua essentially is baby lives here. And so the idea with this study is that this kind of, kind of confronts this idea of represent, representational meaning versus meaning through relationships. And so as rock art researchers and as archeologists and maybe as Westerners, we like to look at a rock art symbol or an image and say, okay, that is a baby, but it's actually not a baby because the name is Wambre Illa, which means the baby lives here. So it's actually referring to a place, a living place at that. And so the place that it's specifically referring to is not this image, but this little hole in the ground right here where Wambre Illa lives. And these are 
This is also a pacarina, it's a water spring. And this little hole comprises the first drops of the Santa River. And so again, we come back to this idea of living things or living places. And this comes back to our concept of atu again, of, 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 of sentient, sentience of, of an object or a landscape feature. So in follow, following up, uh, finishing up this, this section of the talk here, uh, after, after all the research was completed and so forth, we made little ex, uh, museum exhibitions at each one of these communities that told their individual stories about the specific cerros that, they're, that, they're, that, that is their homeland. And so this told the rock art, you know, displayed all of the rock art that is within their specific community. And these were sort of community specific exhibitions that were displayed in each village. And we went around and gave talks and lectures to local universities and schools and so forth to help aid in their, their retention of, of knowledge and information of these, um, of these rock art features. So transitioning into Bears Ear. So what does this all mean for museum exhibition in the Southwest? So as I was finishing, after I had finished up my rock art research in South America, and I started my postdoctoral appointment at LACMA, I was wondering, I was struggling for the first few weeks or so, trying to figure out a project that I was going to do with this, with this museum collection that I didn't know much about because their, their primary focus is actually on uh, Mesoamerica. And I'm not a Mesoamericanist. And so it occurred to me, it's like, why don't I do something on Bears Ears? Because I have relationships through my prior NAGPRA consultations with a lot of the, the cultural leaders of the tribes of the Bears Ears Coalition. And it seemed like a good opportunity to do something that was more than just a simple postdoc project, project, but it'd be something that could actually be useful for the communities and actually could advocate for the protections of these lands. And so this, what this turned out to be was not just my project at LACMA, it turned out to be a collaborative exhibition between LACMA, the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County, the Bears Ears Intertribal Coalition, and the, tri and the tribes themselves of the coalition, not just the coalition itself. And we were fortunate to get some funding, funding from the National Endowment of Humanities uh, last year, actually. So why Bears Ears? Why focus on Bears Ears and not some other cultural landscape? There are several important reasons. One, because it is a small but vital aspect of a much larger traditional cultural landscape. Also because it's a plural and multivocal landscape. And it's not just, you know, there's not just one one, one perspective that tells the story of this landscape. There are diverse perspectives. Also, it's a, it's a flashpoint for conservation and land right issues throughout the Americas and beyond. It also represents an unprecedented land management agreement between tribes and the federal government. And lastly, it's an opportunity to utilize collections to build relationships, advocate for protection, um, provide resources for our partner communities and provide science education for our visitors. So the project origins, as I like to say, this project started in 2006 through my NAGPRA consultation because that's who I was working with originally through this project. And so my consultations with them specific to this project started in 2018, coincidentally, right around the time when the monument was officially slashed um, by the Trump administration. And so this is when I started going out and start in visiting communities and talking with people and sort of in a similar way to what I did in Peru, just inter introducing myself to the people that I didn't know, reconnecting with the people that I did know, and trying to gauge if this was a good idea, if there was interest in this idea, and if people would like to work together on this. And fortunately, the answer was yes, more or less, you know, all around, pretty much all around, the answer was yes. And so I conducted several field trips between in 2018 and 2019 to do consultations, follow-ups, research on collections, research on exhibitions and so forth. And we had two meetings with the tribes. One was, one was in uh, Bluff, Utah in April of 2019. And the other one was with the coalition and tribal representatives from the tribes of the coalition at the Museum of Natural History of Los Angeles County in February of 2020. And so this happened at the last week of February of 2020, and there was an agreement that everyone said, you know, this is great, let's go forward and do this. The words all system go were used. And then we all know what happened two weeks later, COVID hit. And so things have been pretty, it's been slow going ever since then um, for, this, for this project and really for everything else for that matter. But fortunately in the meantime, uh, we were able to get an NEH grant uh, about a year later which really expands what we are able to do with this exhibition. This means it can possibly travel now. We'll be able to use other collections aside from LACMA and National History Museum of Los Angeles as well. So in this meeting, we really wanted to determine what the stakeholder goals are. 
what what do what do the tribes and, and communities that are really the people of the Bears Ears what do they want out of this exhibition? Um, really, and these are the, and we did these these uh, these matrices and so forth to to really shed some insight on this question. And the the main points we 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 came up with were first person narratives were absolutely important, and this is something that was really important from the from the onset is that we don't want you know, we don't want to be telling other people's stories for them. Rather, it's better to provide a space for people to tell their own stories. We also, there's also um, requested that, you know, that we promote um, importance of traditional cultural knowledge as part of this ex exhibition and promote advocate, advocacy of the Bears Ears and other regions of the Americas through understanding. And museum exhibitions have a way of impacting people that maybe films or, you know, articles and things of that nature do not. Obviously, also we want to generate resources that are designed to retain um, traditional cultural knowledge uh, within the within the communities, and of course, along the way, throughout every step of the process, the idea is to protect and respect the sovereignty of the tribes. And so, never be pushy. People share what they want to share, and that's it. If people don't want to share much or anything at all, they don't have to. If they do, that that's fine too. But the idea is that again, this is a space for people to share their stories if they want to. And so with the exhibition overview, what we have now is essentially, it will be the tentative opening date is for 2023. That may have to be pushed, at, pushed back again due to Omicron, uh, maybe 2024 now, but it will be at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County in a 4,000 square foot gallery, which will accommodate approximately 60 objects and will be a, a, a wide diversity of materials and metalwork, ceramics, textiles, contemporary art, um, and so forth. The format will consist of archaeological, ethnographic, and contemporary objects, drone videos, augmented reality, virtual reality uh, uh, experience as well, and interviews and audio recordings that will supplement or complement some of the objects or photos or videos uh, that are presented. All of the labels will be in first person. They will also be in Spanish and English and also in their, their the, the respective uh, native language for which the talking point is focused on. Now, the general big idea of Bears Ears Living Land is that it's a place that contains and transmits the histories and memories of a diverse groups of Native American peoples to which their identities are inextricably linked. And this concept applies to Native folks in Southern California or wherever else it may be displayed if it becomes a traveling exhibition in the end. So the foundation of this idea of it being a Bears Ears Living Land kind of draws back to, again, my NAGPRA consultation experiences and my rock art research in Peru, where we focus on the interrelations of past and present people, objects specifically considered in terms of their materials and their symbols, and also the land primarily considered of rock and water. Sky could be involved, but this is where we're working with right now. And so it bears, an, in, pardon me if I didn't clarify this earlier, this is very much a work in progress. And so a lot of these things are still being defined and worked through and developed. So the main humanities issues that Bears Ears Living Land seeks to address are one, that land nourishes people's identity, as is reflected in the big, in the big idea, this idea of non-Western histories, the plurality of the land, the idea that Native folks are not gone, they are still here, here they are, listen to their stories, and this idea of meaning through relationships, not just representation. And I'll go through these one by one. So this notion of land nourishing identity. So this is through one's experience with the land and through one's ancestral relations with the land. Okay, so ancestral relations, again, being the land or landscape features being living beings themselves or from the remnants or the marks of the footprints of the people that of, of the actions of past people who were there before. And these, these aspects, these archeological aspects, the natural aspects, the rock features, the water features, these all act as repositories for social memories in very similar ways that museum objects do. And these are really kind of gets back to our NAGPRA discussions of getting these, getting, making these links between museum objects as living beings and repositories and, of memory and landscape features being, being living beings and repositories for memory as well. And so this notion of engaging with the land, it doesn't just reflect these, reflect these links, but it actually contributes to maintaining a reciprocal balance in the world and in the cosmos through which people draw their identity from. 
Now this notion of non-Western histories, this is loosely based on an, this, this notion of prehistory. So a lot of people that aren't archeologists or anthropologists often have, have, have the idea that history is just the written word and that history in the Americas began when Europeans came over and started documenting people, places, and things like we see in our Spanish uh, Chronicle here on the right side of the screen. So, but non-Western histories are not just focused on written words. They're, they're constructed through engagement in institutions which incorporate landscape features and objects and stories and songs and symbols and materials and all these different things that come together to really co-create histories between people, land, and objects. And also next, the humanities theme is the complexity or the multivocal nature of plural landscapes. So a lot of people, especially people that don't live in the United States, and this exhibition will have an international audience because it's in Los Angeles. And so a lot of this messaging and a lot of the design is, is really intended for people that don't have a lot of experience in these things. But a lot of times people think of you know, Native Americans as one single homogenous social group. And as we know, that's not the case. And so the idea is to really convey the plurality of Bears Ears as a land. And so our traditional presentation, and this is how I was taught growing up um, you know, in the 80s and 90s, is that, you know, that things are pretty homogeneous. And you know, we have this notion of Southwest and this idea of Southwest is really a matter of perspective. I mean, the Southwest is the Southwest of the people from the, from the Northeast. It could be the Northwest or other people, or for other people, it could be the Axis Mundi or the center of the universe. And really what this kind of amounts to, when, you know, the, I can only speak to the way that I was trained, at least going to museums as a young kid and so forth, is that this really comes about as siloing. It's that we have this culture group here and this culture group here, and sometimes they come together and it doesn't really, Get at the nature of how enmeshed social interactions are. And this tends to reinforce static views of people as being unchanging and so forth. And when we look at cultural maps and so forth, we can see our, our photo on the right here. We see like a lot of these culture groups are just juxtaposed living side by side and they're not really interacting with each other. And so this is something that the, the Bears Ears exhibition is really going to try and uh, dissolve this, this, this notion. And so we'll, having more, we'll be having more of a focus in this. And the, the geographic region, which we will be primarily focused on, will be in the yellow box there. And this map, I think, better conveys the, the multi-layered nature of this particular land and the land throughout the Americas, in fact. So this notion of meaning being derived through relations and not just representations. And so this is really centered on a notion of object and land-based epistemologies, how people understand their ontologies and their realities and so forth. It's getting to, back to this idea of not just representation, things representing things, of them being social beings themselves and how these social beings are co-creative agents that are enmeshed in social networks. And so people create their histories, they create their worlds, they create their identities through interacting with museum objects and with the land and how these things actually hold and transmit their histories as well. And again, we can draw examples from our Atu and from Wamba Hilda. And lastly, we have the, our humanities notion is that native peoples are not of the past. And also that museums should support the continuance of living cultures. They shouldn't be putting them in vitrines and presenting them as past peoples as if they're gone. And museums have been guilty of this really for the majority of their history. It hasn't been until really the last two or three decades that museums have really in earnest tried to work with native communities and to really present the true story of them still being here and move away from this salvage paradigm that museums were really created upon over a hundred years ago. And so one of the methods for this is first person presentation, using, using these not just first person messaging, but also the languages themselves, which will really help convey the notion of the plurality of the landscape. And so I use this photo here. Um, I, I showed this in a previous slide. This is the old exhibition, um, North American exhibition from the Field Museum, which is being dismantled now. And this is one of those older exhibitions that sort of, you know, maybe presented people in sort of in, as an a static state and an impersonal, you know, sort of an impersonal presentation as well. And so this is what we're moving away from. So those humanity themes are woven, they're not directly stated in the exhibition, but they're woven throughout a set of thematic sections that convey those, 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 um, those humanity themes as well. And they are emergence and migration, embodiment and animation, sustenance or traditional ecological knowledge, trade, balance and harmony, union and conservation. 
And so there are a lot of objects that I'm going to present here that are not from Bears Ears. And again, the exhibition is not about Bears Ears. It's about the focus of Bears Ears as a, as a talking point for greater traditional cultural landscapes. And so the, a lot of the objects here are from LACMA and from the Natural History Museum because those are the collections that we had access to. So now that we have a larger budget, we will be borrowing objects from different collections as well. So the, the object list will change. So starting before we get into the thematic sections, you'll introduce to the visitors what exactly Bears Ears is. And the key takeaway points in this introduction will be this idea of a cultural landscape. The common visitor, most of them do not know what a cultural landscape is. So this is an important critical aspect that needs to be conveyed clearly. Obviously, it's an area in Southeast Utah with a huge density of cultural and natural resources. Again, it's a smaller but larger, it's a small but critical part of a larger traditional cultural landscape, has diverse indigenous perspectives, and is a landmark management strategy between tribes and the federal government. So getting into this idea of emergence and migration, this will sort of be the origin story of each of, each of our, our partner stories as it relates to Bears Ears. And so this kind of gets into this idea of pacarina or, or emergence, emergence uh, into this world. And so the, the main takeaway will be that Bears Ears is central to the historical narratives of the tribes of the Bears Ears and their tribal coalition into this world and their journeys to where they reside today. And each of these relationships are, are unique. And this can be, again, conveyed through symbols, like we have our swirl symbol on our, on our pottery vessel here, which I've been told by several, by several folks that this, this, this symbol, this image conveys emergence into the world and these journeys through, the, through, through Earth um, as it is today, or possibly through Zuni stone carvings, like we have here on, on, the, uh, on the bottom left, which could tell the, the ancient journeys of the clans. Um, their emergence into this world, their journey through barriers and so forth. Something like Ute moccasins could be used as a talking point for migration as well. Or even rock art panels, like we have here at the Tutuvani, the Hopi, where the Hopi clans have been visiting since the time before time and marking this particular rock. So all of these are various ways of conveying ideas of emergence and migration and tying them in with bear's ears, even though they're not on bear's ears, but on the National Monument itself. So moving on to gallery C3, we have embodiment and animation. And this again comes into this idea of waka or the, the, a, a landscape feature being a body or living space or kamai, the, the life force that flows through everything. And so the main takeaway here is that certain landscape features and objects, including their materials and symbols are considered the body or living space of ancestors. And then they activate uh, connections between living and past peoples and the land. And so we can focus on something like Valley of the Gods, where these rock formations are ancient Navajo warriors whose deeds were so great that they became lithified and occupy the landscape permanently for, to, to, as reminders of, of one's history. They could also be conveyed through materials like the shell we have here in the lower left-hand corner, shell being of the sea, talking point for long distance relations, or of turquoise or jet or coral, different types of stone, and how these different materials embody uh, certain objects and certain ideas and concepts. Or also through symbols, like we have in our, our, our Navajo blanket here in the lower right. Um, this could possibly be a talking point for the, the whirling log story, the, the story of the boy who taught himself, which is coincidentally uh, takes place on the San Juan River, just on the border of Bears Ears. And any opportunity to to remind people that this symbol is not a swastika uh, <laughs> is a good opportunity and should be taken up. Moving on to gallery four, we have sustenance. And this again gets into traditional ecological knowledge or again, Kamai. And our main takeaways is that Bears Ears has provided spiritual and physical nourishment for thousands of years and continues to do so today. And this really focuses on this inseparable link between physical and spiritual nourishment. And we can focus on spirit and physical nourishment with perhaps more mundane things like the Ute fish trap we have here in the lower right corner, or it could even focus on ceremony like we have with the Hopi Kachina in the upper left-hand corner here, and how these ceremonies not just bring food to people, but they bring water, and, thereby, and therefore are auspicious signs of the ancestors' presence, presence and so forth. And this, again, can also can be conveyed through symbols or iconography. For example, we have the corn motifs on the rock art panel in the upper right-hand corner, and also in our jetted or yellowware bowl in the lower left-hand corner. So, gallery five. 
trade, exchange, or relationships. We don't have a, a, a defined title for this. But the idea is, again, coming back to this idea of tinku or union or confluence or coming together of people. And the main takeaway for this is that Bears Ears was an important cog in an enormous trade network that linked people and their, their ideas and objects from places as far away from Mesoamerica. And this can be conveyed with, for example, something like uh, macaw remains, which are found in the Southwest and some in, uh, in the Bears Ears region itself, like this, um, this loincloth or pelt, uh, which is found um, at the edge of the cedars just outside of, of Bears Ears National Monument itself. Um, it's our hope that we could loan this. Um, it would be doubtful, but then again, if you don't ask, one doesn't ask, one doesn't get. But hopefully we can have at least a photograph or somebody talking about um, this really unique um, unique work. Uh, it's also trading relationships between the, the tribes of the coalition themselves. Uh, perhaps a uh, chief's blanket could be a talking point for that, but also trade and relations between Western and non-Western peoples, like you can see here with our, with our um, with our Nampeo bull here in the lower right hand corner. So balance and harmony is gallery number six. Again, this kind of gets into this idea of Kamai, a life force, keeping that balance, keeping it harmonious. Again, this is the idea, the main takeaway, maintaining the balance internally, socially, and environmentally with ancestors is crucial to indigenous relations with the land and with time. And the Bears Ears itself is integral to maintaining these relations. When it's damaged, these relations, balance and harmony becomes, down, becomes damaged or imbalanced itself. And again, this can be conveyed through something like ceremony, through practice or action. Something like a kachina doll could be a, could be a, could be a talking point for that. Or it could be done through iconography with our cross motifs um, on our Salado vessel up on the top center here, or something that had, conveys perhaps balanced uh, iconography or a sense of balance and so forth. And again, these are drawing from art historical perspectives as well, not strictly anthropological perspectives. So this balance in harmony really becomes disrupted as I mentioned, as I, as I briefly mentioned earlier, through things like looting and vandalism. And we've had permission from some of the tribes to, to, to present and display some possible burial items as a talking point for saying these are the types of things that are being looted. And when they go, people's identities start to erode with them. And it's also an opportunity to really sort of present kind of visceral and, uh, and impactful examples of looting or vandalism rather. For example, this, um, this rock art uh, petroglyph panel that's been you know, the victim of uh, someone shooting at it, presumably. Also, things that, that risk the balance and harmony as well. There are mining and private private interests as well. As many of us know, the largest uh, uranium mill is situated just outside the monument, and it's been the center for uh, uranium uranium waste from all over the continent for really the last thirty years or so and beyond. And so. With these private interests, we can sort to we can perhaps juxtapose the present monument and the mo mo monument boundaries, and how those and how those relate to the slashed monument boundaries, and how those boundaries relate to the uranium deposits themselves. Now it's hard to tell with these maps side by side, but what I could perhaps envision in the exhibition is that there will be one screen and people can press a button and these things will be superimposed on each other. And you'll be able to see how the slashed monument boundaries are just coincidentally that are not over the uranium deposits. So th it's sort of this will kind of come into the talking point about balance and harmony. And our last gallery will be union and conservation. Again, this again, union coming back to this idea of Tinku. This idea of Bears Ears is a living land that unites past and present peoples. And like other living lands across the globe, it is being threatened. And this could be an opportunity to talk about, you know, burning the Amazon and so forth and other, you know, cultural landscapes that are being destroyed, oftentimes intentionally, other times through things like climate change. And it's also a major takeaway is that the monument's establishment has united the tribes of the coalition, many of whom have had traditional differences going back centuries before the arrival before the arrival of Europeans. And this will be an effort to educate others on the need to preserve this unique landscape. And the way this can be conveyed is perhaps something that, you know, communicating union like a like a Navajo uh, a wedding basket, something like these interlocking coils on our Casas Grande pottery here in the bottom here that's We've been told by several folks that these interlocking coils really represent a, a union or coming together of peoples. And one thing that's been discussed is having a collaborative work 
produced by artists from each tribe of the coalition that will act as itself as a as, a, as, a, as, a, as an, it is an act of unity in and of itself and this for myself this is something that i reminded of something when we were at the field museum when we had this father and son collaboration of renowned uh, clinkett carver uh, nathan jackson and his son but i think that this is something that could be done perhaps more cross-culturally and it is ambitious um, but everyone seems to be really um, positive that, it's, that it could work out well. So that's the, main, that's, that's the main aspects of the exhibition itself. So as far as programming is concerned, one of the central aspects of this exhibition are the satellite versions of the exhibitions, which will be specific, culturally specific for each tribe and which will be presented on tribal lands, whether it be schools or cultural centers or wherever the tribes want it to be. And for this, we can, hopefully use some objects from the exhibition, but we can certainly use assets like photogrammetric models, augmented reality or virtual reality experiences, videos, photographs, and so forth. And these will tell each tribe's unique story. We focus on each tribe's unique story as it pertains to them. And the idea was that this will aid in the retention and transmission of traditional knowledge. These will be complemented by educational materials and also artist workshops will be held in conjunction with the main exhibition itself, perhaps weaving or potting workshops, um, pottery workshops, things of that nature. And obviously these, um, another intention, this will help further develop relations between the groups or partners and the museums itself. Looking beyond the programming, what I'm envisioning is that I would like for these satellite exhibitions and the main exhibition itself to be the focus of a symposium, and which will which will bring experts, uh, landscape research experts um, of all of all types and disciplines, um, to produce ultimately what would be an edited volume, which would centrally focus on linking museums. Uh, and their objects to landscape research. And this would also focus on many of the central aspects of the exhibition, plural or contested landscape, um, cont you know, contemporary indigenous and landscape issues in the Americas. And of course, these would be also be a collaborative effort that would be co-authored with, um, with, with, uh, with, 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 with tribal um, contributors as well. So thank you very much. It was a pleasure to share the story with you. I know it, it ranged from, from North and South America and across disciplines and so forth, but I hope it all came together nicely. Um, thank you for attention. And uh, if you have any questions, I look forward to hearing them. Thanks again. Thank you very much, Gordon. That was a fantastic talk. It was, it, it was beautiful and it was very um, fascinating as well. Um, yes, please, if anybody has any questions, uh, please feel free to ask if you have a question or a comment. Uh, please just go ahead and, and turn on your camera and, 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 and ask yourself. Well, I have a question. So, you, so you, you've obviously done a lot of uh, uh, fascinating work and I'm wondering um, whether or not you envision uh, doing any sort of similar uh, work in collaboration with the Maxwell Museum. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, I've 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 spoken with uh, with the, the director of the Maxwell Museum, uh, Carla Sinopoli, my boss, uh, about the possibility of utilizing some of Maxwell's collections. Um, uh, now that we have the funds to do so, um, she she did say yes in, in a casual conversation. There are no official yeses, yes, but yeah, I would very much like so uh, to incorporate the Maxwell's collections and the hope and the idea is that our NAGPRA consultations through our repatriation work at the Maxwell will help to cross fertilize this project and this exhibition. Fantastic. And Hi, Laura. Go ahead. Nice talk, Gordon. Really glad to see your work in detail. It, it really looks like an exciting project, and I'm so glad that it's moving forward with an expanded budget and and uh, time frame. And it it raises for me the the idea of how how you are able to work with the Bears Ears tribal communities to give this longer life beyond both the the presentation as part of these facets of the exhibition, but how do you think they will be able to bring it back and continue it as um, an aspect of education for younger tribal members and various other ways that it continues to build in the tribal setting, in the community setting? 
Sure. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Um, the, the details of that, I don't know, yet, but that was really sort of the, the underpinning idea of the satellite exhibitions. It's not just to provide resources as a one-off, but something that will live beyond and something that, you know, re, reusable resource or something, something of that nature, something that will stay with the tribes after the exhibition has come and gone so that this thing doesn't, so that it doesn't just exist in a book somewhere. Yeah. You know, it, okay. it, yeah. So I don't, I don't know the details of how that will work. And I frankly, the way I see it now, I think that'll be out of my hands. <laughs> um, that, that will be up to the tribes and, and how that works going forward. But that has always been the hope and the desire of the satellite exhibitions and the various programming initiatives uh, yeah. with the exhibition. Super. It's going to be a great project. Um, looking forward to seeing how it develops. Thanks. Hi, Carrie. Well, that, oh, can I go? Can I can I go next? Okay, uh, Gordon, that was an amazing talk. What a great what a great! I loved how you pulled in all of the work that you've done in Peru with the Bears Ears. I thought that was wonderful, um, and this Bears Ears uh, exhibition sounds just amazing. So I wish um, I would love to have you talk a little bit more about some of the um, the ways that you felt were most successful in bringing together the tribal. Um, representatives in developing those ideas of the themes. So maybe just give give us some ideas of how that worked and what you thought was most effective. Well, I think any level of success, I think, is directly attributed attributed to prior NAGPRA consultations, um, primarily through the Field Museum, where I was able to really establish good relations with a lot of the cultural leaders who were involved in these consultations in the first phase. So. They were in, the, in those consultations from 2006 six and 2010, folks were very, very generous and open with their knowledge beyond the consultation, beyond the claim and so forth, were very open. Obviously there are things that they didn't, they were not appropriate to tell me and so forth. And I didn't, I didn't pry. But a lot of those concepts informed the rock art research. And so after doing the rock art research, I came back with more clarity on a lot of these things. And of course, there, there are a lot of similarities, but there are also some important differences too. And those differences are just as, as valuable, I think. So I think, so any level of success, I think was really on the one hand, attributed to good relations being developed in NAGPRA consultations, and then actually having, having following up with things that were sort of maybe relevant from uh, relevant perspectives that were beyond North America or beyond the Southwest as well that were applicable. So, but thank you for your words. I'm glad that uh, it sounds like they were tied together. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Coherently. Definitely. Uh, Carla. Lot, lots of museum people asking questions. <laughs> so that was wonderful, Gordon, and thanks so much. And Carrie and I were, chatting back and forth about some of some of your ideas and how we can also um, br bring you into the Maxwell work. But, but I actually wanted to ask you about gender. Um, I was very struck by the uh, Andean pictures of the groups that you were speaking to that were all male. Um, and I, I wanted to ask you about, are you, or how are you incorporating kind of gendered knowledge of the landscape and place? into the project. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up, Carla, and apologies for not emphasizing that in my talk today. So in the consultation with a lot of tribes, a lot of, a lot of our consultants have expressed explicitly that they want the women's story to be told, whether that's through the production of the materials, through iconography and so forth. And so there's not just you know, a story about men and so forth. As far as the photos uh, of the work in the Andes, a lot of times, in my experience, when, the, when I had those consultation meetings, women weren't present for a number of reasons. They were often, men tend, tended to be kind of together more, I suppose. And in in, in, so some of those meetings were impromptu. So it was like, okay, let's have the meeting. The one on the photo on the right here, I'll go back. Sorry, if, if, am I still sharing my screen? Um, I'll stop sharing my screen. So our photo on the right here, and I'll share my screen again if I can. Sorry, I've not seen Zoom here. 
Okay, so the photo on the right here, this was the men's side of the room. Okay, my wife took that photo because she was on the women's side of the room. Okay, so women were not excluded from that meeting. Um, it was really interesting in these meetings in the Andes. I, I don't, I can't speak to the Southwest, but in that meeting, men and women were both present. Men only spoke at the meeting, and I don't know why that was, but a lot of the perspectives of the meeting, well, the women's perspectives, were communicated to me afterwards. So I don't, there are certain ways of, of ways of discussing these things that I, that I frankly don't know about, um, and, and way of people situating themselves in a meeting room, obviously. So a lot of the, the women's perspectives on that research project were communicated to me after through men. So maybe, I don't know why that is. Maybe, I, I, I won't even speculate as to why that is. Um, but as far as the exhibition is concerned, in addition to telling just the, 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 the female story or women's stories, it's not just women's work and women's production of, of museum objects and so forth, but maybe the, 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 the possible gender of landscape features as well, if there are any. And I think, yes, I agree. That's something that should be highlighted in this exhibition. And it's frankly something I have not developed yet. We have not developed yet. Thank you, Carla. Loa, did you have a, another question? I, I was just gonna mention, um, because the, the prospects for developing your interests and this opportunity to, to look for ways to tap this tremendous project and your and your grounding and the and experience with developing the idea just at the start of the week i was in in-depth conversation with the national park service staff out at petroglyph and the their enthusiasm is coming together in recent weeks with a greater commitment to wanting to work with the university with our local communities um, to to bring together a real collective group to address how to rethink petroglyph and its interpretations and various other ways of communicating to the broader um, communities, plural, right? And I just think there's a tremendous opportunity for, for, for you to be part of that conversation and for there to be this really fruitful, interesting development um, for, uh, for your work here at the Maxwell and with our partners right here in the middle Rio Grande. I think there's a tremendous interest and in the opportunities of pulling threads of your experiences, both with NAGPRA and cons consultations, which are critical, but then also this deep appreciation for landscapes and the the spaces and entities that are very much part of them. I, I just, it's, you've got lots of things to do here. We're glad that you're here at the Maxwell. Well, thank you so much, Lila. I would, I would be honored and I, I, would, I would, yeah, I would, it would be a dream to work in Petroglyph in any capacity. I've always been fascinated with that place and others in the, in the region. Um, when one reason in particular is that it's volcanic rock, which is which is a really a critical aspect of, of the Peruvian research as well, this idea of volcanic rock coming arising from the underworld and so forth. So anyhow, that's just always sort of been my my little dream about it. But yes, if there's ever an opportunity, I would enthusiastically jump on it. Thank you. Maybe you just answered this question, but uh, somebody in the chat asked, uh, do you intend to continue rock art research within the Southwest and continue with cosmology uh, uh, within North America? But you may have just answered that question. <laughs> I, would, I would very much like to, yes. <laughs> Good. Are there any other uh, questions or comments? Well, excellent. It's it's three o'clock. Uh, Gordon will will let you go. Thank you very much for a, a wonderful talk. It was it was really a, a wonderful put together talk and uh, lots of really fascinating information. So thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Ian, and thank you all for attending. I really appreciate your your questions and your comments, and I uh, look forward to seeing you. Okay. Have a good week. Oh yeah, and welcome to New Mexico. That's a <laughs> that that's great. So happy to have you here. Uh, have a good weekend, everybody. Uh, we have a talk uh, scheduled for next week uh, as well. So, so see you at the same time uh, next week. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you.